Welcome and thank you for attending the Black History Matter series presented by the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum. My name is Victoria Basurto and I am a current senior at Colgate University located in Hamilton, New York, and also an intern at the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum. I will be facilitating the series of 28 presentations that will be released throughout the month of February, 2021, and that you can view on our YouTube channel or on our website. I will now lead you through some introductory statements. The National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum is located in Peterborough, New York, in the building that you can see on the screen where the inaugural meeting of the New York State Anti-Slavery Society was held in 1835. Nahoff's mission is as follows. The National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum honors anti-slavery abolitionists their work to end slavery and the legacy of that struggle, and strives to complete the second and ongoing abolition, the moral conviction to end racism. Nahop has worked in coordination with the Garrett Smith Estate National Historic Landmark, which is also located in Peterborough, New York, to create the Black History Matter series. The following statement is the purpose of the Black History Matter series. You can read along on the screen. Nahoff supports racial justice movements seeking to address racial inequality given their resonance with Nahoff's mission to address the second and ongoing abolition to end racism. Nahoff believes a significant number of Americans do not understand the current racial justice protest due to their unfamiliarity with four centuries of Black American history because this history was either excluded or taught inadequately in schools. Nehop knows that education is a powerful step towards ending racism and that understanding the history of the enslavement and dehumanization of Black Americans provides critical context for the ongoing racial justice movements and the persistence of racism in America. Given Nehop's commitment to strengthening knowledge of history as one route to confront racism, Nehop will present Black History Matters, a series of crash courses covering examples of neglected topics in Black American history throughout the month of February in 2021. I'd like to now welcome our presenter, JJ Citron. JJ Citron is a Colgate University alumni of the class of 2020, where she graduated summa cum laude with honors in peace and conflict studies. She served as a 2019 Upstate Institute Fellow at the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum and has been honored to continue her work with Nahoff as a Cabinet of Freedom member. From June through September of 2020, she examined the intersection between race, technology, and law as a research assistant at the University of Washington's Tech Policy Lab. She spent the fall at NextGen Pennsylvania, working as a field organizer to flip the state back to blue. She intends to attend law school in fall of 2021. I'd like to now inv invite JJ Citron to begin a presentation on the Tulsa Massacre. Um, hi all, thank you so much to Neha for having me on as a presenter um, in the Black History Matters series. Uh, my name is JJ Citrin and I will be giving a presentation on the Tulsa race riots as living history beyond 1921. I wanted to preface my presentation with the way that I've decided to frame my discussion of the Tulsa race riots, not as an isolated event, but rather a culmination of racial tension in Tulsa and beyond, as well as a part of the legacy of state toleration of violence against Black people and the use of law as a weapon following the riots themselves. I will also be examining attempts to recoup what was lost through reparations on both a state and federal level. But before I begin my discussion of the race riots, I wanted to give a bit of background about Tulsa in 1921. Greenwood um, was the black section of Tulsa that was comprised of 35 city blocks um, that housed 8,000 residents, a central school, shopping, hospitals, hotels, and a movie theater. Um, it was known as the Black Wall Street. There was a growing sense of optimism for the future of the Black community in the U.S., not just in Tulsa, but beyond. Part of this is because of um, Black participation in World War I. Black Americans fought, but in segregated units. However, this involvement brought a sense of hope for the future of racial relations in the United States. The NAACP advocated that participation 
in the war effort could foster a greater sense of Americanism that we could then be used to counteract racial tensions. Following World War I, we also see a rise of the New Negro Movement, which was supported by W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, the, the movement advocated for social change and greater respect from white Americans um, because of um, specifically black participation um, in the war effort. As well at the same time, um, the Harlem Renaissance was occurring in Harlem, New York as a flourishing hub for black arts and literature, um, but a flourishing in cities across um, the North as well as in the Midwest. This was a result of the Great Migration and industrial expansion in the North um, and increased migration um, to not only Harlem, but also Northern and Midwestern cities. Um, this growing sense and flourishing of um, Black arts and Black literature and, and this rise and call for improved race relations contrasted with the reality of racialized hostility in both Oklahoma and beyond. The Red Summer of 1919 consisted of almost 25 race riots throughout the country. So you see this contrasting sense of, um, of alleviating racial tensions and calls to, to, to end um, racial tensions, but at the same time, increased hostility. You can sort of see this, this contrast in this image in the Tulsa Star, um, where you have this sort of culmination of, of lynching, hatred, mobs, and prejudice. Um, so that, that's depicted here, and I just wanted to include um, this cartoon from the Tulsa Star. So leading up to the riots um, was, was one pivotal event um, that occurred on May 30th, 1921. Um, black resident of Tulsa, Dick Rowland, was accused of assaulting a white woman named Sarah Page. The day after, he was arrested. Um, following his arrest there, there was a lynch mob um, outside of the Tulsa courthouse. 6,000 white people assembled calling for, for the lynching of Dick Rowland. Um, and in response, Greenwood residents mobilized in order to prevent this lynching. Um, on June 1st, fire and violence erupted in Greenwood. And in this image, you, you can see the, the burning, looting, and arson of the 35 city blocks um, in the Greenwood district. And on June 1st, as this fire and violence was, was going on, the, the governor, um, Governor Robertson, declared martial law at 11.30 a.m. So you sort of see this absolute suspension of any sort of semblance of law and order um, as violence erupted. I'm going to talk about the citizen-state collaboration at this point um, in, while the, the Tulsa race riots were occurring. White residents um, volunteered their services to be police, and they were, they were then deputized. White mob blocked the fire department to put out the, the burning of the 35 city blocks. The police referred to this as a Negro uprising, even though it was the 6,000 white people who assembled outside of the courthouse calling for, for a lynch mob of Dick Rowland. National Guard collaborated with local authorities to disarm and arrest black men, looting and arson led by, by white folks against um, the Greenwood District, as well as local aviators who were dropping nitroglycerin on buildings in the Greenwood District. So just absolute, uh, complete and utter destruction. Um, so sort of examining the, the way in which this violence was responded to, um, officers completely ignored all um, anti-Black violence and really only focused on as Black people as the ones who were causing all of the destruction and completely ignored all of the, the violence against Black people. Um, courts refused all relief claims from the, the looted and burned buildings. Municipalities were protected from paying any sort of liability or like being held accountable for rebuilding and, and bringing back the area that had been completely destroyed. Um, and you see a contrast of mob violence versus the written law. So in theory, you know, black people are supposed to be protected from, from this violence, but the only people who really were protected um, were white residents. Um, 
I wanted to include um, a graphic from the Chicago Defender. Um, so what you see here is two images in War and in Peace. So on the top image, it says, in times of war, when an allied soldier dropped his weapons and raised his hands as a sign of surrender, the barbarous Germans um, apart his life. And then the bottom image in contrast, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, however, defenseless men, women, and children were murdered without a chance for their lives. Um, so I think it's really interesting here that you're, you're comparing World War I um, with the, the, the Tulsa race riots because World War I was an opportunity for Black people um, to be involved in, in participating in the war effort. And in that moment, in that participation, they were seen as Americans. But you know, the, immediately after World War I ended, they were again seen as, as less than, even during the war um, in segregated units, you know, Black soldiers obviously were not treated the same way as white soldiers, but that sort of sense of Americanism and patriotism was one of the more positive aspects of, of the war itself. But then again, right after it ends, you know, no longer seen as, as Americans, but Black Americans and therefore less. So just a really interesting contrast that I, I wanted to point out. Um, the aftermath of the violence. So just rough estimates between 75 to 150 um, people died. 35 blocks of the entire Greenwood district burned. Um, and as I said before, this previously was a real hub of um, black culture and black life, and it was known as the Black Wall Street. Um, 1,000, over 1,000 families were, were homeless and a grand jury exonerated the white violence and blamed black residents. So this image, you can see just the absolute destruction of Greenwood. Once Greenwood residents were reduced to the status of helpless refugees, they then posed no challenge to white authority and could inst instead be seen as objects of charity and subject to white control. I wanted to also include the way in which the, the narrative was manipulated, um, so I'll read this out loud. This was Richard Lloyd Jones. He was the Tulsa Tribune's editor. He published an editorial in the Chicago Tribune um, following the Tulsa race riots. And he said, quote, there is a bad black man who is a beast. The bad black man is a bad man. He drinks the cheapest and vilest whiskey. He breaks every law to get it. He is a dope fiend. He holds life lightly. He is a bully and a brute. A dozen of such collect at the Tulsa County Courthouse with firearms as they hear the lynching rumor. As soon as this small band of armed black men came upon this scene, the Tulsa police with or without the aid of county officials should at once have thrown a line around them and marched them to jail, but they stupidly let the psychological moment pass. Then a white struck a match to the incendiary mob power by trying to take a gun away from a black man and the fighting began. So you, you can see the way in which the narrative by even mainstream news media was absolutely manipulated to demonize um, Black residents of Tulsa. Um, after the Tulsa race riots, law was used ab absolutely as a weapon. So for example, the city zoning board in, instituted really restrictive requirements for the way in which new buildings could be um, rectified. So for example, the, the city zoning board required new buildings in the, the burn district to use fireproof material and be at least two stories high. And this was really a means in the ultimate goal to convert Greenwood into an industrial district um, and one in which black life could no longer return as like a, a residential um, hub. So by instituting these very strict um, building requirements. Four months later, judges granted a permanent injunction against these restrictive zoning um, requirements, but at this point, the, the four months had passed and it, it was really prohibitively difficult to abide by those um, restrictions, so it, it was unable to return to that flourishing hub of Black life as, as it once, as that damage had been done. Um, in 1921, there was a call for reparations. Um, state court decision protected mun municipalities from any injury liability in response um, to this call for reparations. Five million dollars of damage claims had been filed and nearly all were denied, as well as ten thousand dollars were allocated to, to relief efforts, but zero to reconstruction. So as I said earlier, the way in which this money was allocated was, was really fueling that narrative that 
black people were helpless and they just needed this relief rather than actually assisting with with the reconstruction. So the way in which this money was allocated actually continued and perpetuated that narrative. Um, just also something to note, right after the riots, uh, Mayor Evans claimed that white Tulsans were as blameless as if the destruction had been caused by a cyclone. So just an interesting aside there to really you know, see the way in which this powerful narrative had been um, construing black people as the sort of arbiter of destruction and white people as blameless. I wanted to include a small snippet from the Black Dispatch um, from March 15th, 1923. Quote, the white citizens of Tulsa are in debt to the Negroes whose property they burned and the lives they wantonly destroyed. And we believe that there are those who will make some effort to repair the loss which they have caused. They cannot forget it. They admit that it was wrong and they feel deep down in their hearts that they should repay. It will always be a debt until it is paid. And the way Greenwood looks today, um, something I also wanted to discuss, the, the vast majority of residents who were alive during the 1921 um, race riot, they are no longer living. There is now an interstate highway, um, I-244 over Greenwood Avenue that runs through um, what was 35 blocks, the, the Black Wall Street, as well as continued denial of history and ever-present gentrification. There was never any sort of formal apology um, or financial expenditure given to individuals, businesses, and communities um, who's, who are still impacted by the legacies um, of the Tulsa race riots. I wanted to talk about state level efforts um, in addressing reparations claims. So in 1996, the state legislator, legislature authorized formation of the Oklahoma Commission to study the Tulsa race riot of 1921. And in 2001, this final report was published. The commission's final report states that the, the city had conspired with the mob of white citizens against black citizens in Tulsa, and it recommended a program of reparations to survivors and their descendants. The state passed legislation to establish scholarships for descendants of survivors, encourage economic development of Greenwood, and develop a memorial park um, to the massacre victims in Tulsa. This park was dedicated in 2010. And in 2020, massacre became a part, finally, of Oklahoma school curriculum. So you see how slow the pace is of addressing um, the, the 1921 race riots. Um, just this year, it was instituted as a statewide requirement to talk about it. Um, this it is also is hard because you see this commission is you know recommending that all of these that debts be paid to descendants um, of um, victims of the 1921 um, massacre, but recommendations can only go so far, unfortunately. And on a federal level in 2005, the US Supreme Court rejected an appeal um, to hear the Tulsa reparations case. So you see um, on the federal level, this was has not yet been recognized, but um, in September of 2020, a lawsuit was filed by a group of Oklahomans. Um, the plaintiffs include relatives of those affected by the 1921 Tulsa race massacre, as well as a 105-year-old survivor of the Tulsa race massacre, um, Leslie Benningfield Randall. The suit leans heavily on public nuisance law um, and, you know, talks about how the massacre created and perpetuated inequity. Just to talk about the, a little bit of the numbers, um, in Tulsa, 34% of black people live in poverty in comparison to 13% of white people, according to Human Rights Watch. Um, the black unemployment rate is more than double than that of white people in the city, and the median household income for black residents is $20,000 less than white counterparts. Um, the suit itself estimates just that the property damage suffered by residents of Greenwood District is between $50 million and $100 million in today's currency. So this lawsuit filed by a group of Oklahomans is seeking reparations from the city of Tulsa and other local government entities. Call for relief include payment, property development, um, mental health, and educational incentives um, to make up for this destruction of black wealth that occurred in 1921. According to the Federal Bank Reserve, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, um, historical data reveals that no progress has been made in reducing income and wealth inequalities between black and white households over the past 70 years. Um, that's just more of like a, a general note, but I thought it was a really striking statistic. 
and I, I wanted to include that. The, the Federal Reserve Bank also noted that this means that pre-civil rights era disparities have largely persisted, um, which is absolutely wild to think that, you know, so much time has passed, but really how much has changed. Definitely incredibly frustrating. A bit about the physical remnants um, in the, the survival of, of the evidence of what has occurred what occurred in 1921. Um, in October 2020, a mass grave was found in the Oaklawn Cemetery in Tulsa. At least 18 were identified, at least 18 total identified and identified victims were buried there and 11 coffins were located, um, all victims, black victims of the, the Tulsa race riots. In term of, terms of addressing this ongoing fight for reparations on a federal level, um, HR 40 is a piece of legislation that um, proposes the study of um, reparations and, and potential for having reparations in the US. Um, and this will be detailed in a later Black History Matters um, series. So stay tuned um, for a presentation on HR 40. And I just wanna thank you so much, Neha, for, for having me as a speaker and I really appreciate it. So thank you all for listening. I'd like to thank JJ Citroen for that educational presentation. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, JJ has provided a reference list of sources with websites that you can explore to learn more. This reference list will be linked beneath the video in the video description. I will also invite you to fill out a quick survey also linked in that same video description, which will help us gather feedback about this specific topic. The survey will take you no more than five minutes to fill out and will provide us with valuable information that will help in the creation of future presentations like this one. If you have any questions about the presentation itself, JJ Citron has made her email available so that you may contact her with any questions or comments that you may have. Additionally, please do contact Nehoff if you're interested in learning more about the organization or have any questions. Uh, Nehoff's contact information is available on the screen. Once again, I'd like to thank JJ for providing a program for Black History Matters. I would also like to thank you, the audience, for joining us on this educational journey. Please remember, we will be releasing a new presentation each day this February of 2021. We hope you will join us at our next presentation. Thank you.